Guys, this is a full rundown episode on how to get primal. You are looking into getting into traditional archery or you have got into traditional archery and you're just getting really frustrated. You keep trying and saying, this is the year I'm going to do it. This is the year I'm going all in. And then fall comes around and you're just not quite prepared. I've got the guys on the phone. They're going to save you all that frustration. I've got Mac Zernzak from the Push Archery. And we talk all about his journey into traditional archery, all about his uh, journey into developing developing the method of archery that they have adopted. And um, maybe one of the best shooting methods you could adopt in order to get that confidence in shooting your recurve. We talk about tuning methods and how your tune will change if you shoot different ways. Guys, this is one of my favorite conversations. It's a great episode full of information if you're looking to getting in traditional archery or if you're a traditional bow hunter and you just want to get a little more accurate with your bow. As always, this episode is brought to you by our good friends over at Scentlock. Guys, I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. Welcome to Bear Archery's Hunting 101 podcast, where hunters new and old come to learn and find inspiration from stories of hunts gone by. Everyone is welcome to enjoy the outdoor way of life, and there is no better time to start than right now. So let's head into the great outdoors with your host, Dylan Ray. Guys, if you're a traditional archer, and you have not checked out Three Rivers Archery, what are you waiting for? Three Rivers Archery is your one-stop shop for all things traditional archery. They have the largest in-stock selection of of traditional archery equipment anywhere. Same-day shipping, very, very, very knowledgeable. Listen, I use Three Rivers all the time. If I've got a question on tuning, if I've got a question on broadheads, if I've got a question on brace height or anything like that, I use Three Rivers for everything. They know the products because they use the products. Three Rivers Archery is by far the gold standard when it comes to traditional archery. So guys, if you're just getting into traditional archery, I would encourage you to use Three Rivers as a resource for knowledge and understanding and growing and learning and as a place to get all those products that you're going to be needing as you take this journey. All right, Matt. So... Before we jump in, man, give us an introduction because I have watched you guys' film, um, a traditional archery film. That's the title of it, right? That's correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I have watched that. Um, I watched that probably a year ago. And uh, and ever since I saw that video, I'm like, I got to get this guy on, man. Um, just finally, finally worked out and finally got you on. So um, yeah, super happy to be we, here, man. Before we jump in, give us an introduction to your start into archery. Oh man. Um, so this would have been, uh, quite a, quite a few years ago. Um, my buddies and I, like when we would come home from school, uh, our, we had a local bow club that, um, my best friend's dad was a part of Oneida bow hunters here locally in Butler, Pennsylvania. And, uh, we used to go there. It's, it's awesome. It's a backcountry outdoor 24 target outdoor course. You jumping up in tree stand shooting for, for score, uh, just all just, completely about cutting your teeth on bow hunting at this club. It's just really cool. Really strong um, traditional contingent there as well at this club. And we would come home and on Tuesday nights, my buddies would go to this bow club and, you know, walk around with a six pack of beer and have fun every Tuesday night. And I couldn't go because I wasn't a part. I didn't shoot archery at the time. And uh, my buddies at the time, which is really interesting, they were, this would have been early 2000s right they were hunting with 1980s hoyts that were never <laughs> taken care of and never maintained <laughs> like compounds right and so yeah. when i would watch them shoot at the family farm when i was around with them and the bows did come out like i mean crap was flying off cams were blowing up i mean sliders were coming off these bows so my first introduction to archery was watching my buddies bows blow up on them while they're shooting so at that yeah. point i'm like man recurves recurves and longbows seem pretty cool and much safer than that. So yeah. at the time I, you know, this was like right around February. I told my, my fiance at the time, my now wife, man, recurves and longbows are cool. I want to get a bow. I want to be able to go participate um, at, at the bow club on Tuesday nights with my buddies. And my best friend was her older brother. So, and, uh, that Christmas that year, my wife, uh, surprised me with my very first recurve, a PSE coyote and, uh, haven't, haven't looked back ever since. That's it's awesome, great. man. Um, yeah, yeah that's, you know, for me, so I got started bow hunting at a, at a really young age. 
but the transition to traditional archery was almost the exact same. Um, you know, you start looking at this and you're like, man, it just looks more intimate, more, Mm -hmm. more fun. You know, to me, I tell everybody like this compound or, and I still hunt with a compound. I'm not a hundred percent traditional. Um, uh, we might dive into sure. that, but I know I've talked about it in recent episodes. So, um, I'm not a hundred percent traditional. I'm 80%. Um, but that was the appeal to me. I'm like, man, compounds is kind of like a science. Mm-hmm. Whereas traditional archery is an art. Like you have to figure out your own equipment. You know, there's no, there's no manual. There's no, you don't pull out a manual and it says, yeah, it's not, it's not, you know, if you put, if you get a new compound, you pull out of the box, it's going to say on the limb bolts, max six turns or whatever it is. There's Mm -hmm. a science to that. Whereas traditional archery, it's an art form, dude. And it's, it's, it's the the variation. You're exactly right. Yeah. The variation that goes into the, the bow, the system when you're shooting the bow, right, is just so many more variables in traditional archery compared to more modern equipment. Uh, and that's what makes yeah. it so intriguing because if if you just collapse slightly a quarter inch, you're three inches, four inches right at 20 yards, right? It's just, it's so, the yeah. nuances are, are so minute. It's amazing. Yeah. It's addicting. Absolutely. As you know. <laughs> so, yeah, for sure. And, and you're kind of, you're kind of, well, first off, where did the name push come from? Because I almost said you're push for archery, but, but, where did that even come from? Yeah, so so when when Tim and Emma and I de- decided to to create this this first film that we put on YouTube, um, we were trying to figure out what the name of the film should be, and it's called The Push, a traditional archery film. And we actually, our our brand wasn't even called The Push at the time. It was <laughs> it's an awful name, but it was called Trad Tips. That's like the original name that we were calling ourselves. <laughs> so when you watch some of our really early films, like Trad Tips comes up in the in the credits, and thank God we changed that name. Um, but the film, we named it the push because we wanted it to be the push to get you to try traditional archery, or right. you might be a guy that, that has, has aspirations to hunt with a recurve or a longbow or get their grandpa's old recurve off the wall. Um, and they practice with it all summer long. And then they, they feel like they're getting proficient, but as soon as August hits and then it's, you know, put your money where your mouth is just the confidence isn't there and they hang the recurve back up and they pick up the compound, they hunt and they're like, ah, maybe next year. And this cycle just continues, but it's a desire, something they really want to do. And so the film that we put together was just a a soup to nuts, one-stop shop of everything you need to know about traditional archery and all the different ways that you can approach shooting the bow to give, give you the confidence that, you know what, this season is going to be the season that you're going to walk in the woods with your recurve. And that's why one of my biggest tips is like, don't start in October. And, and people are like, what do you mean? There's no, <laughs> yeah, right. I'm like, sure. like I, so, so just so you guys know, we're recording this on July 5th. So last night I set at a 4th of July party with one of my best friends. Um, and he's a phenomenal compound hunter. And he recently bought a bear grizzly and he's wanting to get into shooting a recurve. Nice. And so I just told him, I said, man, let's get you set up. Let's get you shooting decent. And let's run down to Texas and shoot pigs. Let's run down to Oklahoma and shoot pigs. Uh, and he's like, but why? And I'm like, well, hey, you're going to test your equipment. You're going to know if your broadheads perform. You're going to know if your arrows shoot good. I mean, you're going to test all those things, but you're also going to build all this confidence. He said, because oh, yeah. when you go in two days and stack six bodies of pigs, like now there's no question if you can do it or not. You, you've already proven you can do it. Um, so that's that. my biggest tip is like, just start hunting. And, um, Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys work with, uh, I don't know if you guys work with Chris Perino at all. Um, but he was instrument. Like when I started this, he was like, dude, the best way to get good at shooting a recurve is to hunt small game with it. And I'm like, well, that's, Oh yeah, that's fair. And so like, you know, leading up to deer season, I shot, I just shot every squirrel I would ever see. And, uh, you learn, you're like, okay, if I can shoot a squirrel at 36 yards, I can probably shoot this deer at 14. Like you just, and yeah, you and I are cut from the same cloth, the man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I love hunting small game. I agree with Chris. Chris is an absolute killer, man. He's, he's yeah. Awesome. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And so, before we dive into your method of shooting, which I don't want to give it away if people don't know, yeah, yeah. Uh, your your shooting method. Walk me through your journey to get there, like the the frustrations and when you first got that first bow. Oh, um, dude. <laughs> man yeah this is a great question because because there was a lot of them because and you know i just dove in right and i didn't have any mentors i didn't have anything at the time and that's kind of what started the our brand the push archery yeah um in our in our 
our mission statement is to expedite the traditional archery learning curve. And we were born out of necessity, if you will. So essentially, uh, Tim Neville was, was one of those bridge people that just was super deadly with a compound, had interest in, in picking up traditional archery. And him and I had went to, to, you know, high school together, college together. And he asked me, Hey, and this is at this point, I'd, I'd been hunting, bow hunting with a, with a recur for, you know, six, seven years and gotten pretty proficient at it. Um, and so he's like, Hey, can you take me under your wing? Can you show me, show me the ropes? So we did that. And after about, you know, a couple months, he was super proficient. He was feeling confident, ready to go out in the woods. And the idea came up, Hey, let's, let's create a film that gives you everything you need to know. Cause the frustrating part that I had was my start in archery was I didn't have any mentors. And so I had to go to five or six different online forums and watch all these different DVDs just to be armed with enough information to think I'm buying the right type of bow and think I'm approaching the bow and shooting it properly. There just wasn't a resource out there that had it all in one location and then showed you everything because you go on to an online forum or even a Facebook group and you ask a question and there's a thousand experts that do it a thousand different ways. And it's really frustrating to know who's who and in what style, what, what preference yeah. maybe matches up with your body type or matches out with how your brain works. Um, so that, that's kind of where that was born. But my, my start was very frustrating because I picked up the bow. I started hunting with it. I, I got it in Christmas time. So I practiced, I mean, like, you know how it is when you get obsessed with shooting traditional bows. It's just every time you walk out the door, if it's hanging there by your man door, you're just like you shoot. 10 more arrows, yeah. 10 more arrows. And sure enough, your, your wife's like, Hey, you said you're coming in 30 minutes ago. <laughs> like, and it, you just keep 10 more arrows, like at a time, a couple more quivers. And, uh, and so I, I shot so much and I, and I got really, really good and started bow hunting. And no matter how good you are as a backyard champion, when that first deer, that doe or buck walks out in front of you and they're standing broadside at 15 yards, dude, you just can't even keep the arrow on the arrow shelf. You're just shaking so bad. Yeah. And I missed my first 11 deer I shot at. I shot them all high above their backs, 11 deer in a row in two years. And it was my 12th deer on the ground. I shot, I shot them. Um, and it was just like the greatest thing. And once that happened, once I finally got that monkey off my back, the floodgates opened up and then it was just multiple deer a year for, for you know, a, a decade or plus, whatever. And, uh, and then, then that's when then the push came out and that's, that's was kind of like the driving force behind me wanting to do that. And, you know, Tim wanting to push us towards that is, is it just to prevent people from having to go through that. Like you don't have to struggle that hard because there are easier ways to shoot a bow that maybe match up with your, the way your brain works, the way your body works. And I just, it took me a while to find that. So what's your, what's your tip or what's your, so I'm the type of guy just this last year, I go to Idaho and I shoot a bear and, um, mm -hmm. I honestly, I hit right where I was aiming. Like it was a perfect shot. I just overcompensated for the angle that the bear was at. So I shot a bit high. Mm. We never found the bear. And so I was just like, you come home def defeated. You're like, man, I spent nine days on the mountain. Yeah. I shoot a bear mm -hmm. and we never find it. Uh, so I'm like, I'm going to the woods. I need to kill something just to make up for this. And then I, and then I have a giant come out and I shoot right over his back. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> and so I told my wife, I come home right. and she's like, like she could just tell I was just, I was mad. It's like, what's up? And I'm like, what do you mean? What's up? I'm taking the compound out in the morning. Something's dying. <laughs> and so I go out the next morning and shoot something with my compound. And then I'm like, why did I do that? Like I, I ended up shooting the deer that I shot my compound at like 13 yards. And I'm like, I always talk myself into that. Like I always change that, sure, that right. mindset. <laughs> um, so yep. What do you tell the That's guy? like the classic because, story, you know, yes. <laughs> of, of people are like, um, I just, I would feel terrible if, a, if Mr. Big comes walking out at 35 yards, I'm going to, I'm going to bring the compound today. And sure enough, he's, uh, you can spit on his back, <laughs> you know, yeah. that night. That's just well, always how it works. And we haven't got to talk much. Um, but I, I, uh, I'm also employed, uh, by Pope and Young. That's my actual career, mm -hmm. my actual mm -hmm. job. Um, and the average shot distance on a Pope and Young animal is 24 yards. Like people don't, that's an incredibly doable distance for a recurve. Sure. And so yeah. if the average shot distance on, on big mature animals is 24 yards, that means a lot of them are coming at, at six, seven, eight yards. I mean, so yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. You'll get the shot. 
you know, I, I tell people like this, people are like, well, I never get to deer at 17 yards. I'm like, because you shoot them at 40 before they come in. Like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. if you give them time, they'll work in, but you hunt with a compound. So you're shooting them at 40 before you get them at 17. Like, but when they get at 40 with a recurve, man, your hunt's just starting. Like you're just oh, yeah. in the yeah, game. Yeah, the, there's no doubt. Yeah, and and your your stand setups, the way you approach ambushing these animals completely change whenever you're carrying a recurve versus versus a, a more modern equipment in the woods. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, you know, similar to um the data that you just recited, um Cody Greenwood from Trad Lab uh mm-hmm. has has done this data analytics uh to where we go out to the community and we're asking for people to fill out survey surveys based off encounters that they had. And we we ran this big lethality study where we were looking at we wanted to understand and dissect different broadheads, different aerotypes, different poundages, longbows versus recurves, shooting styles, um, distances of shot distances of how far the animal went after the shot. So we just gather all this data. Then we put this through this big, big analysis. And then every year we come out with a lethality study podcast that kind of reviews all that data and just kind of like helps people narrow down and, and make decisions on you know what they want to do uh, with their equipment. And one, one very interesting part is obviously with us being a traditional archery brand, we're getting a whole lot of feedback and, and, um, uh, data entries from the community that is mostly traditional bow hunters, but the average shot distance is like 14 and a half yards in the traditional yeah. archery community. Um, so, across all that. So, it, you know, yeah. So, so Go. what I wanted, what I wanted to ask was, was how do you stay in the game? How does the person listening hmm. and mm-hmm. last year they missed two, two does and a buck. How do they stay in the game sure. to where they don't jump back to compound, but how do they, develop that mental fortitude to hang in there and, and continue to try to do mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not sure if it's uh, something that you can develop, right? It's, it's almost has to just align with your goals because everyone goes in the woods for different reasons. Some people go out there because they want an Instagram picture. Some people want nothing to do with taking pictures or social media. Some people are out there for the meat. Some people are out there for the experience and some people are out there for a combination of all those things. Um, so at some point you're going to, transition into wherever your desires are versus, um, you know, what equipment that you're carrying into the woods. And as life goes on, right, you might just have different goals. So if if your goal right now in this stage of life or this season of your life is to fill your freezer up, and you're one of these guys that regularly with a compound are putting eight deer down and an elk and a bear, right? And you have to have three chest freezers full and you have five kids and you're eating all that meat, like might not be the best time right now. Like your your goals yeah. probably don't align with traditional archery equipment to start off with. Now, there are bow hunters out there, Chris Perino, right? Aaron Snyder, when he's hunting with a recurve, like there's guys out there that are just laying down animals, but it's, it's a different skill set. It's a different approach to hunting and it takes time to learn. You don't do that right off the bat. It's not like a light switch that transfers all your skills that you learned. All animal behavior skills that you're learning with a compound are for sure transferable. Um, however, like you kind of mentioned earlier, sometimes you know the, the compound bow hunts end at 40 yards and there's a lot more to animal behavior to get into that red zone of 20 yards and under to, to be able to harvest them with a, with a traditional bow. So, you know, it, that's a tough question. I, I have got that question a few times on like, how do you convince somebody just to stay in the game? And I have a hard time doing that. Like, I don't want to give these people a pep talk and, and keep pushing them to continue to get frustrated when the equipment that they really want to hunt with maybe doesn't truly align with their goals and with where they are with the se- season of their life right now. Um, but if it is truly your goal, I mean, you just got to stick with it. It comes down to a discipline thing. I mean, it's just, it's no different than, are you going to go get up and wake up and and work out this morning when you really don't want to, right? When you know that there's an easier path, it's just, it's just a discipline thing. Like, okay. And, and I've heard people say like, they're trying to make the transition and they decided like, this is the year I'm going to transition and and hunt a full season with a traditional bow. They had to get rid of their compound because the temptation of it hanging there when, when, when things get rough, you know, to p- take that out is, is too high. And you know, that that's another like discipline thing, right. To where they're like, I know where my goals are. I want to hunt with a traditional bow and see what I can do with it for the entire hunting season. So they sold their bow to make sure that the temptation wasn't there. Um, but you know, it, it's tough. It's, uh, it's, 
it's a frust it can be a very frustrating sport, but yet it's 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 the best out there, man. There's nothing like bearing down, looking down your oh arrow shaft and, and putting that arrow like right where just, he needs it to go with a recurve, man. It, even just walking to and from your stand. Like that sounds <laughs> right. What is goofy. it? What is it about? Like, look, you're sitting in your tree stand. You're just like the bow's laying on your lap and you're yeah. looking at it. You're like, God, dude, this thing is just cool. Yeah. You know, uh, I know exactly what you mean. It, but it's just something about, I don't know, just the, uh, the heritage in it. Maybe the, like mm-hmm. I said, it's an art rather than a science. I don't, I don't know, but there's just something about walking it through the woods, holding a stick in your hand rather than holding a machined piece mm-hmm. of equipment. Um, it's just, sure. it's, it's so you can't, you can't explain it. You have to, but yep. my thing, I tell people, you got to get rid of two mentalities. You have to get rid of the mentality of if I just had my compound, well, you don't mm-hmm. have your compound. Oh, sure. That's like right. you don't. So just get rid of that thought. Like, because I can always play that. If I just had game, I can always, yep. you know, if the deer's at 200, I can always go, well, man, if I just had a rifle, this hunt mm-hmm. would be over. Well, yeah, I would like, yep. but I don't have a rifle. I'm not on a rifle hunt. Um, so we have to get rid of that mentality of if I just had this, you don't. So just get rid of that thought. Um, but also the idea of well, I'm going to like, like we already alluded to, I'm going to take my compound just for today. If you take your compound, mm-hmm. you will never shoot one with your recurve. If you take a rifle, you will never shoot one with your compound. You have to decide. That's right. What what do I want to, what do I want to kill this with? And it came down for this yep. on that bear hunt that I talked about. I was actually on an elk hunt and I took my recurve and people call me nuts. And I, you know, I, I had this, this battle in my mind and I, I told my wife, it came down to this. I would rather shoot a cow elk with my recurve than a three forty bull with my compound. Like that's just where I mm. was at. Like, I would rather do it with this piece of equipment and, and shoot a cow rather than do it with that piece of equipment and, and shoot a giant bull. Um, and so you just have to feel like you said, what part of the, what part of your journey are you on and, and figure that That's out? Right. Um, yeah. What motivates you, you know? Yeah. Cause I, and, at some I, point, like for most hunters, like maybe the bloodlust goes away, you know, when you're young and yeah. you're just trying to s- stack animals up and you know, for, for whatever your motivations are. But at some point, like I know people just, get disenchanted with it. I, you see it all around these bow clubs. You see these older gentlemen that are, you know, in their late forties and fifties, sixties, you know, and they're just not as hardcore as they used to be. Yeah. But then you transition them into a recurve and they're shaking like a leaf when a doe comes walking in and they've not, they haven't felt that when the doe in 20 years, you know, yeah. and it's just, it's just a way to just incrementally make it, make the bow hunt more challenging. I agree. And for me, um, trust me, I love to kill stuff. Like I, <laughs> I'm a trigger man. If you say shoot, it's going to die. I don't care. If <laughs> Buddy, me too. Giant. Um, <laughs> yeah. but again, I'm just at that <laughs> point in my life where I'm like, I would rather shoot a doe and be able to say, I did it with my, my recurve than to shoot a, you know, a 160 and do it with a compound. It's just different for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I was spoiled. I'll say that I was spoiled and I get that comment more than maybe anything else of like, <laughs> well, yeah, if I got to learn from Tom Clum, I'd be good too. And I'm like, you can just fly to Denver. Um, but so like, I never had that struggle. Like I went straight from a compound, uh, to practicing with Jim Willems and, and Harvey Ebers and, mm. and Tom Clum. And so I never had that like struggle, um, because I jumped right into, yep. into, you know, good form. Um, by the way, I don't know if you've ever worked. Have you ever had Harv Ebers on the show or talked with him at all or know who he is? No, so I know who is, he is, but I, I, we've not had him on the yeah, show. One of the founding members of, of Pope and Young inducted in Archery Hall of Fame, inducted in Pope and Young Hall of Fame. Just mm-hmm. a, an incredibly cool old man. Uh, I would highly encourage you to get to drive to Missouri and get with him because it's he's no, awesome. So yeah. Um, but yeah, so I never had that like struggle. Now, obviously shooting a recurve, there's days where you're just like, I suck. It's time to go inside. So how did that journey, like, what did you start off with? Did you start the whole slap shooting instinctive, you know, pull back and let it f- fly right when it gets to your cheek and hope you hit something? How did that, that shot execution process look for you? 
No, oh, yeah, great question. So, um, and, and I'm going to preface this conversation with the way I do it does not mean it's the right way to do it for you. It's just the right way to do it for me. And unfortunately, when I started out, there was not the information available as readily as it is today that would allow me to get on the right path faster. And that's really yeah. the push archery, what we do with our online school. We, like we have an online course, like you, you keep referencing Tom Clum. We have an online course with a online teaching Tom Clum, no matter where you are in the country, you can buy it and, and take over eight, nine hours worth of instructional content from directly from, you know, the master himself, Tom Clum, which is super cool. So th these types of and resources got Joel weren't Turner. available at that time. Yeah, Joel Turner, we have Draw Jenkins, Jimmy Blackman, yeah. we have an online tuning program with Cody Greenwood, just a lot of really cool resources. And that was the mission that we had, you know, that kind of lines up, I guess now is a really good time to talk about that, because it kind of lines up with where we are in the conversation. Um, and, and that's where the push kind of came from was, because it took me so many years to get on the path that best meets myself. Now, I got onto the instinctive shooting, I was a G Fred ass bell. I mean, devote, <laughs> devote follower. I, I paid a ton of money. Like I paid a $1,500. I won a St. Jude auction through trad gang and went up to our, uh, Fred's house for three days, me and three other guys. And we, uh, we had a one V four, um, shooting clinic with just him at his house. It was like one of the greatest long awesome. weekends of my traditional journey. Incredible. I have pictures framed all of my office and stuff, uh, of, of that weekend. Now, People would look at me and how I approach shooting the bow and the type of content we've produced over you know the last six, seven years and say, oh, you're anti that style of shooting. And that's not true at all. It's just what I'm passionate about. And it's the way I approach shooting the bow. And there are like extreme killers that hunt with a more traditional looking kind of hunched over, instinctive, quicker shooting uh cadence right and they call it snap shooting but that's not a negative term i mean kurt cabrera i don't know if you know him he is yeah. just an absolute killer in the woods he he well and we is, can go through there's a lot uh, of guys i mean like if you ask and oh and i think yeah, i can Barry say this Wenzel. Making it mad, i mean <laughs> but if you if you ask tom clum like hey what about what about um what about chris perino shooting for him he's gonna be like it's not good but you don't change anything with a guy who kills everything in the world. Like, <laughs> right. Exactly. Don't mess with Chris. And he has, like, he, for, that's right. He has a method that works for him. Right. And, yeah. and so does Kurt. And so do all these guys. And so Fred that's, Eichler. that's where really, I was going to go on Fred Eichler. Ex exactly. Um, the Wenzels. And I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And so I was on that instinctive shooting and kind of more quicker, a little bit more of a snap shooter path for, six, seven, eight years. And I killed a pile of deer that way. And it's super effective. And I always want to keep that in my toolbox. And that's another thing I would very like, even if you believe that you are on the right path of shooting approach for you personally, mentally, and physically, I still urge you to practice and try other things and other approaches because you put that in your toolbox. You never know when you're going to have a running hog running in front of you and you're going to take up that five yard shot as he's running by. Like you ain't holding and getting an anchor and holding for three or four seconds and then getting a perfect aim on the thing. Like you're going to be snap shooting instinctively, like trying to feel that arrow into the right spot. So it's a good skill set to put in your bow hunting toolbox for sure. Yeah, and so that, absolutely. that was the process and, and how I approached shooting the bow. And then as we started building this online course and, and, getting into bare bow competitive archery i started competing in ibos and starting to rub elbows with like the great shooters of of single strings like john demmer Dwayne martin all these big names uh i started to adopt a little bit more erect style of shooting standing up a little bit taller uh aiming methods um different type of approaches to to string walking and shooting the bow there and then that stuff slowly started bleeding over into my bow hunting world and i started finding some of these things are like really applicable to the bow hunting woods and just deadly medicine and whitetail because I, I i don't i don't travel around the, the globe hunting all types of exotic animals i'm i'm a whitetail specialist right i i stay close to home i'm hunting them in ohio west virginia uh western pennsylvania and that's like the what i'm super passionate about and when you're shooting these animals at 15 yards and under 20 yards and under in really tight bedding area <laughs> like close quarters yeah. um there's some cool aiming methods that are just dynamite for the traditional bow hunter and that's what i started approaching and started using those styles and they just they work with my brain and my body more and that's the approach i take to shooting now i do want to i've been wanting to do a video on this for a while and you've kind of you've kind of walked me into it so i'm gonna go ahead and 
share my thoughts here. <laughs> okay. I think the moment you say instinctive shooting, people immediately associate mm-hmm. you with that slap shooting style of 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 shooting. For sure. I Absolutely. I don't I used to 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 shoot point on. I I used to. Um Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how I learned. Now I shoot instinctive, but I still practice perfect shot execution. Um, yep. I Dude, I, I, I saw a few of your videos um, before we started recording. Uh, and you, you have great form and you, your well, shot execution notice is I awesome. Said, I said practice shot execution. I'm not, I'm not a perfect shot, but <laughs> I, I practice good execution. Sure. However, I'm an instinctive shooter now. Like I don't, I don't look and say, okay, the deer's at 24 yards. So the point of my mm-hmm. arrow needs to be right under his belly. I don't do that. I look at the place I want to hit and I, I perform a, a good shot execution. I used to think yep. if I want to shoot instinctively, instinctively, I used to think if I want to shoot instinctively, <laughs> then I had to just pull back and shoot. And that's not the case. Instinctive shooting does right. not mean that you can't practice good shot execution. And and yep. to be quite frank, I know guys who say I'm a point on shooter or I shoot a fixed crawl or I shoot and then they pull back and, and let go right when they get to their face. So mm-hmm. sure. The aiming yeah, method, we can we can smash that stigma right now for sure. Do it. <laughs> that's my yeah. that's my that's so my, so you're exactly right. There's like there's form in the cadence in which you shoot and how you approach biomechanically how you shoot the bow. And then there is setting the arrow on a trajectory path, which is yeah, I love how Joel Turner states that setting the air on a trajectory path. So you can either, so let's just talk about the biomechanics side of that first. You can stand up tall and have a more classic field style or competitive style of, of shot. You can run that shot fast, or you could run that shot very slow. Then there's all degrees in between of rotating your upper body and canting the bow to 45 degrees, even maybe more. And again, you could run that shot hunched over with a heavy cant of the bow like you're shooting from your knees in a, in a ground blind, like all of you need to be able to practice all these different biomechanic forms because it's, it's bow hunting and you're in the woods and you're walking to your stand and there's a low hanging branch in, ahead of you and Mr. Big standing right there at 20 yards in the middle of the path. Like you got to get an arrow into him sometimes, right? And you got to go to into kill mode. And sometimes that means you got to get down on your knees and, and can't that bow. Even if you're a stand up vertical bow shooter, it's good to have that in your bow hunting, you know, tackle box, right? Yeah. And, or your toolbox there. So but that's biomechanics. And then there's the aiming methods. And the aiming methods, again, is just setting the air on a trajectory path. And you can let that let the subconscious handle that, which is, quote unquote, instinctive archery to where you're staring at the spot you want to hit. You've shot that shot so many times that your arrow, your subconscious brain looks at some landmark on your bow, like your near side of your sight picture, like your bow, your hand, whatever it is, whatever it's using as its reference to that target, it's setting that trajectory path. And then you're letting your shot go. And that arrow is arcing into the target and your, your subconscious mind is tracking that arc and continually refining and practicing that shot. That's instinctive archery. But then there's all kinds of other uh, approaches to aiming and setting that arrow on a trajectory path using your conscious mind. And that is gap shooting, fixed crawl, string walking, but all of those are just using the tip of the arrow in reference to the target with your conscious brain right. and saying, okay, I know I'm this far away from the target. I'm going to stick my arrow tip here. That looks good. And then you run your shot. And then there's a blend of the two. There's what they call instinct to gap. And that's personally, that's the way I shoot. That's when I shoot. That's when I'm shooting the best. And that's when I feel I'm the most lethal in the white toe woods is whenever I'm, I'm paying attention to where my arrow tip is in relationship to the target. But I'm not saying as that animal's approaching, oh, that that deer is 15 yards now. I know I need to hold it three inches below its chest. And then I'm running that shot. It's just that that deer's coming in. I'm just in the moment figuring out when's the best time it's going to be to draw the bow. I'm, I'm in bow hunting mode. And then I draw the bow back and that sight picture goes, mm, there's a green light. It's like, oh, yeah, that looks good. Permission to move on with the shot. And then I continue to run my shot from there. And that's when I feel okay. like I'm shooting the best. I've never heard that terminology because that's that's technically what I do. Um, because I mm-hmm. do reference my point. I, Me too. And I, it's out of my peripherals. Yep. Um, but like once I, the the bow I'm currently shooting, I'm, right now I'm shooting the Eichler Signature Series. Um, and so the, the bow I'm currently shooting, the point on is uh, 47 yards. 
so if I get out to like 40 yards, 43 yards, then I, I really mm-hmm. reference that arrow tip because I know, okay, I need to be right underneath the, the target. So I really reference that. Yeah. But at 20 yards, yeah, I kind of just out of the peripheral, see my, see my arrow tip and just, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, exactly what you just, just yeah, you're described. Like, you're like green light. That looks good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do you, yep. and, and walk me through this because when I switch to that method, rather than a, a gap shooting or a fixed crawl or whatever I had, I had been shooting, when I switch to that method, I actually set my aim before I ever draw. So like I hold my arms where I want them <laughs> and then I okay. draw my bow yeah. back. Now, there are times where I get, like you said, I get to full draw, and I'm like, oh, that doesn't look right. Mm-hmm. So I bring it up just a touch or down just a touch. But for the 90% yep. of the time, I hold my bow, and then I draw, and I know that's where I, I – that's the sight picture I want because that's where my hand – you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Have you ever sure. experimented with that, like setting your your, <clears throat> your yeah. bow arm mm-hmm. before you draw? Yeah, I have. Um, th- what happens to me whenever that that occurs, and I'm going to reference some of Joel Turner stuff here, is you know he references a lot about like you have to let go of the aim b- before you can run yeah. into your shot execution phase, right? You have to disconnect aiming the bow versus executing that final portion of your shot process. And what I find is it's harder for me to get out of the aiming area. The aim he talks about the sh- the, sh- the shot control house. Um, to where you're walking yeah. through the front door, you're making a decision, and then there's the aiming room. And then once you leave the aiming room, you're supposed to close the door and lock it. Don't go back in the aiming room. Run your shot. And what what I struggle with, if I hold that bow up and I pre-aim, and then I'm drawing the bow as I am come back and I'm staring at that like pre-aimed sight picture the whole time, what I'm finding is that it's harder for me to let go of that aim because I'm so engrossed in what that sight picture looks like. Um, I know this is going to sound interesting, but... Um, I actually aim before I even raise the bow up. And so when I stare at that target, I'm looking at the target. I already know what my sight picture should look like. Like I can Uh, feel what it should look like. Like if it's a 25 yard shot, I'm like, okay, my tip, my tip should be roughly right below the chest. Like, or I should be covering up that 10 ring or I should be holding top of back. Like I I already know roughly like what it's going to look like. And then from there, I don't even think about it anymore. I raise the bow up. My hand comes above the target. I actually blind the target briefly as I'm drawing the bow and I'm coming in from above the target. And right as I'm reaching my anchor, that front bow hand is settling down right to where it needs to go. And honestly, it's just a, it's not a, you got to get it at the bottom of the chest or hold top of 10 ring. It is just a, yep, that looks exactly like I was picturing it like that. It's just a quick confirmation just like that. And then I'm like permission to move on. And then I just move on with my shot process from there. Gotcha. Um, so right now with, with your shooting methods, are you still shooting a crawl mm-hmm. to reduce the, the gap? Or are you I shooting? Am. I am. Yeah. I, I've, I've stumbled upon over the last few years, a, a pretty deadly setup for me personally, that it's just gonna, it's going to take, I, I don't know. I just don't ever think I'll shoot a bow at, at an animal any other way. It's, it, it's pretty deadly. So my process is, I guess, so, so for the uninitiated, maybe listening to this, um, for some of the conscious aiming methods. So we talked about the subconscious aiming methods, like instinctive, where you're just staring at the target. It's like throwing a baseball. You're not thinking about how far the target is or any of that stuff and letting your biomechanics and your subconscious set the arrow trajectory and then, you know, hit your target. But then of the conscious methods, um, if no matter where you hold the string, let's, let's say you're, you're shooting the bow three under, which means your index finger is bumped up against the knock of the arrow underneath the knock. So three fingers are underneath the knock. And you draw back and you anchor Dylan, you were saying with that system, with your bow, it's a 47 yard point on, right? Yeah. Okay. So for Dylan's situation, all he has to do, if he knows that targets 47 yards away, he bumps his fingers up against that knock, draws back the arrow anchors on anchors on the side of his face, squints one eye, sticks the tip of the arrow right on the target where he wants it to go. And the arrow is going to arc up and hit that part of the target. Halfway between that, if he did the same thing, so let's say he's standing at like 24 yards, he's going to draw back. If he stuck the tip of the arrow right on the middle of the target at 24 yards, you can imagine the arrow is going to leave his bow, arc upward, and strike the target high. That's what's called his maximum gap. So halfway between him and the target is going to be where he needs to hold his tip of his arrow the lowest. 
So let's say in that scenario, it was like 20 inches. He struck the target 20 inches high at 24 yards. So now he knows once he maps this out, he can map this entire arc. And so basically at 10 yards and at 37 yards, his gaps are going to be the same as they approach that maximum gap towards the middle of his arrow's trajectory. And so he maps that out. Now he knows like, hey, at 24 yards, I just have to hold my arrow tip down by the knuckle of the deer about 20 inches low and my arrow is going to go there. And at 10 yards, I need to hold maybe 10 inches low. And at 37 yards, it's 10 inches low as well. And then his point on distance is, is 47 yards. So that's like what gap shooting is called. Everything's the same with how you address the string with your fingers and how you approach shooting the bow. And you're just referencing that arrow tip. But there is another method called a fixed crawl, which is a variation of string walking. And string walking is just like running a single pin slider. If you're a compound hunter that runs one of those and your sight tape is on the front of your bow. So if it's a 37 yard shot, you're going to dial your sight tape to 37 yards and you're going to shoot that shot and the same at 15 yards and whatnot. But with string walking, we're moving that sight tape from the front of the bow to the back of the bow on our finger tab. And so we have marks on our finger tab and we actually slide our fingers down the string. So we'll slide our hand up against the knock, just like we do in gap shooting. And then there's little marks. And the further down the string you go away from that knock is the closer the shot. So at 10 yards, you might have to slide down the string two inches anchor at the same spot and you can imagine if you're anchoring at the side of your face but you're two inches below the knock that knock's going to be right under your eye and so you're sighting right down that arrow so that launch trajectory you're just adjusting the launch trajectory as the as you're releasing that string and you're just changing the relationship of the arrow tip to your eye to the target so that's a really neat way to do that but in bow hunting Obviously, you're not going to be if the deer is at 25 yards and you make your 25 yard crawl down the string and then he's moved up to 15 yards. It's very difficult to like, oh, gosh, I have to reset and recrawl yeah. and do that all over again. So there's a way to do a fixed crawl. And what I like to do is I set up for about a 25 yard fixed crawl. And from there, it's really nice because bow hunting, if that deer's 25 yards, I just have to stick the tip of the arrow right on where it wanted to go and the arrow is going to go there. But how I like to set up my system is I run a three or a two blade broadhead and I align it. So it's vertical in my sight picture. So when I'm at full draw, one of the blades is completely vertical. And then I paint the back of that blade with white paint with a white paint pen. And so what I do is I set, I've set my system up to, and I'm always referencing off of that vertical blade. It's like a post site for me. So I know, at 22 yards, I can stick the very tip of that blade right where I want it to go. And that's where it's going to go. And at 25 yards, 26 yards, it's about the middle of the blade. And at 30 yards, it's the base of the blade is where I need to reference from a sight picture perspective. And then anything under 20 yards, the very tip of that broadhead is about two inches below the chest of the animal. So like, if I know it's under 20 yards, I don't have to think about anything. I just nestle from a tree stand. I just nestle the very tip of that broadhead blade that's glowing bright white. I just put it right underneath the chest by two inches and execute my shot. And it's usually right where it needs to go. So is that a guessing game or do you have a, a science to figure out? Uh, and the reason I asked, because you said, you know, mine's 47. So the peak of my arrow flight is is you know, half of that 27, 27 and a half, whatever mm -hmm. it would be. Um, yep. so do you have a science as to figuring out what distance I need to set, set my crawl that way I, you know, reach the maximum amount of, of gap in that. Yeah. With good. That That's a really good question. So there, <clears throat> there's not like a formula to put it in and say, I want, I want this type of gap, but roughly what you can assume is if you're running, if you start coming down the string and, and that's really what it is, you bump your knock height up maybe by an eighth inch, and then you can start coming down the string a quarter inch at a time uh, and just get a rough guess. And you do it. You do the same way you try to explore gap shooting. So you're just going to come down the string by a quarter inch, draw back, stick the tip right where you want it to go and shoot the shot. Um, and you can stand at the location that you want your point on distance to be. So if you want it to be a 25 yard point on or a 22 yard point on, just stand there and continue to slowly work your way down the string until you get to the point where you can draw back and stick the tip right where you want it to go. And obviously the longer your point on distance, the longer your max gap is going to be because your arrow has to arc and take a much longer trajectory path to get to the target. Um, so the shorter your point on distance, the smaller the gaps are going to be. 
Uh, so I like to run a, like a t- between a 20 and a 25. I usually every year I settle in on 22 yards. So I'll stand there. And like in this scenario with my broadheads, like using the, the blade of my broadhead, I'll actually shoot and practice with my broadheads on um, and when I'm figuring this out, obviously. And I, and I want it to I want my crawl to be to the point where I can stick the very tip of that vertical blade on the target at 22 yards and, and hit where I wanted to, to hit. And then I'll start slowly start tuning my bow from that crawl. Uh, might have to adjust knock height slightly, maybe some tiller adjustments. If you're running like a, a more modern, modern recurve that has tiller adjustments, but for the most part, it's, it's pretty simple. You just slowly work down the string at the distance that you want your point on distance to be. And then once you find that, once it's there, you can crimp a brass knocking point or tie on an, an, an additional knocking point there on your string. So when you're in the woods, that deer's coming, you're just sliding your fingers up the string with your tab until it bumps that lowest knock that's set at your fixed crawl. And it's just as fast and, and uh, deadly as, as bumping up three under or split finger. It's, it's fast. So j- that's another thing I want to note. I don't ever want to cover up my target. So I hate point on shooting. Mm. Um, yeah. So what I say is my point on, I call it my, it sounds stupid, but I call it my lollipop distance. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I want my lollipop at way. thirty yards. Uh, so here's the tip of my mm-hmm. arrow, and that's what I'm aiming at. Um, so I just put it right yep. up against the bottom <laughs> and make that lollipop. Uh, which I I yep. like that at thirty yards because at thirty yards, majority of my shots are going to come at twenty. So that means I'm not going to mm-hmm. have to cover up my arrow. I know I just hold under a little bit and shoot, and bingo, you're good. Um. The problem with that for me is a lot of my shots still come at 12, 13, 15. So then you're still holding, you know, it's a knuckle the deer. Um, you're still holding way mm-hmm. low. So it's like, well, was there ever a point in creating that, that, that That's crawl right. for me? Um, so, you know, I shoot a full length arrow. So with bumping right up against the knock, my point on is 47. So, you know, once you get down to like 15 yards, you're holding two feet underneath the deer. Um, which can be difficult, <laughs> yeah. but it makes, yeah, it makes those longer, harder shots. You know, if the deer is at 29, it makes that a little more doable because you know, then I'm at his knuckles. Um, so I yeah. don't know. Um, it's just something to play around with. I was going to ask you that though. That's one of my biggest yeah. questions. So if I take my current setup, which is tuned like a dream, if I take my current setup mm-hmm. and just slide my fingers down, is that bow still going to shoot good? Cause I get that question a lot. If um, I shoot a fixed crawl, what do I sure. do my my tune? Yeah, yeah. T- typically, what you're doing is you're going to be preloading the lower limb at full draw more than the top limb, so your limbs are going to be out of time. So a perfectly tuned bow is having perfect horizontal knock travel as your knock is coming from full draw to brace as it's detaching from the string, and both limbs coming together in time with each other. Um, and coming, you know, closing up at the same time, that's going to produce a really quiet, efficient transfer of energy, um, and, and good arrow flight, which is obviously the number one, uh, importance to lethality. Uh, so if you just start coming down the string, yeah, you're absolutely 100% going to change your tune. Um, now sometimes it's not a lot. Sometimes it's nothing big to get it back into tune. Sometimes it only takes maybe bumping up your knock height an eighth of an inch, um, to get those limbs back in time with each other. Um, if you're, if you're shooting just like a takedown bow, uh, like a bolt down or like a one piece recurve or long bow. Um, but for the most part, you can get a really good lethal tune, um, running a fixed crawl just with a little bit more work, but it will absolutely change what you have going on right now for sure. So that that's my biggest question. I bear doesn't make an ILF rig. So Mm -hmm. you you can't, can't change your tiller. Um, Mm -hmm. I already, and I I've asked Tom, I've asked several people about this. I already with pretty much every single bow I shoot have to run about an inch knock high to get it to tune. Oh, Um, wow. Okay. Interesting. I don't, I don't know why. Do you know what your uh, finger pressure is when, when you, when you dress the string, what's your distribution of pressure between your index middle and, and ring finger? Do you know? I try to run, try to run 50, 40, 10, 50 middle, 40 bottom, 10 50, top. 40. Uh, I try. Um, that's probably one mm-hmm. of my biggest issues when it comes to shooting is finger pressure. Um, mm-hmm. But 
I've also just quit quit worrying about it. Like the first couple bows, I'm like, that's too high. <laughs> sure. to I got to do something different. Yeah. Well, now yeah. it's just like that's where it's gonna fly good. So why do I care? Like I don't I don't care what the forums say. I don't care that you know mm -hmm. if you Google it that everybody says you should be you know a half an inch high. I didn't. That's where it flies good for me. So if I go to yep. a fixed crawl, I'm gonna have to bump that even higher. And that just uh, weird not to necessarily. Me. So there's a couple. <clears throat> there's a couple things that you could do uh, to to get around that. So you can explore like just a slight modification of your finger pressure to maybe offset that. Maybe you jump up to to sixty thirty ten. Yeah, you know, uh, just to to take a little bit more pressure off that lower limb since you are coming down the string a little bit. But there's also grip how you're actually pushing into the grip of the bow. Um, right. Are you healing it? Are you up in the throat of the grip? So all of that also comes into play as well. So if you're running a heavy crawl, you're not going to want to be healing the bow and really pushing in with the lower part of your thumb base. You're going to want to be up towards the throat of the grip a little bit more. Again, not preloading that that lowest that lower limb as much as possible. So there's some so there's some small, slight biomechanic tweaks that you can do to like reduce that knock height or or minimize the the impact of running a crawl but my suggestion to you is honestly if it's flying good and you feel confident in it and you can re regularly hit where you need it to hit don't worry about it like as long as your tune is tuned then you're tuned <laughs> it's okay yeah. it doesn't matter where where your knock height not i've ran bows because i've wanted to i was playing a game right whether i was competing or i was hunting something that i wanted to have like a really close point on like turkeys i've ran like inch and a quarter knock heights on my bows before just to be able to get the right aiming picture that i need for the game i was playing that is not un unheard of to to do that for sure yeah so what is what's the what's the setup changes you're looking for uh not looking for do you have to make any setup changes to arrow weights like arrow between now and tip weights between between shooting up against the knock, whether you're shooting instinctive gap mm. or whatever, and then running a fixed crawl. Nope. No, it, it, it doesn't. Like when you're running a fixed crawl, like roughly you're, you're about an inch down the string. And that, that when you look at, if you bumped up against the knock, let's say you were a 28 inch draw length and you pull that, that arrow back, that arrow is being drawn back more the higher up against the knock you are. So there are some slight variations with the amount of energy you're putting into that arrow, but honestly, it's negligible. Like, like I can, I'm not good enough to shoot the difference. Like I couldn't, yeah. if I'm shooting aside from my actual arrow impact, like I don't even know if it would be more than three, four feet per second, which is to me in the grand scheme of things from a bow hunting perspective, I, I, I don't chase speed whatsoever. Uh, I want to, I want to place my arrow where it needs to go. And I want to have to have perfect arrow flight. Like those are the only two factors that, that I really care about. Um, so yeah, to, to answer your point, no, there's, there's no considerations. Um, I would say, I will say that when I'm tuning a rig, when I'm looking at a, a, a system, like a, a bow and arrow system that I'm like, okay, I'm wanting to optimize it for this game I'm playing or this game I'm hunting and I'm starting the tuning process. I try to get a couple different spine ranges and my goal is to never cut an arrow. My goal is to get a perfectly tuned arrow in the velocity range that I'm like looking to get into, like not overly slow and not overly fast. Um, I want a really forgiving setup, but I want it to be full length because the longer the arrow, the less I'm going to have to crawl down the string and the more I can keep Bingo. that bow within like, you know, the tolerances or, or close to running it in a more traditional style. Um, so I, maybe if I ran for, for example, if I'm running a 28 inch arrow, with this, with like a 28 inch 500 spine arrow with like 250 grains up front, I might have to crawl down the string an inch and a half to get my 22 yard point on, or I can run to a 350 spine arrow, run at full length at like 32 inches with the same tip weight. And it's going to be a slightly heavier setup as well, which is also going to benefit me. And I might only need to crawl down the string a quarter inch or a half inch. It's like that significant. So I always try to keep my arrows as long as possible. And then there's so many arrow manufacturers out there. If you're like, well, a 350 is going to be heavy, too heavy GPI for me. I'm trying to keep my arrow under 600 grains or whatever your your goals there are with, with the formulation of your arrow system. I, I mean, there's so many manufacturers making nine grains per inch, eight grains per inch, seven grains per inch, you know, 350 spine arrows. Um, so... I, I just I just shop around. I know exactly what I need, uh, what I'm looking for in an arrow recipe before I go after it, and I always try to keep my arrows full length. So what um, 
what what are you looking for out of weight versus speed? So if I say I've got a 550 mm-hmm. grain arrow and I'm getting 175 feet per second, you know, what, what are you looking for there as far as, yeah. as weight and speed and velocity? So things have drastically changed for me here over the last uh, season or two. Um, so seasons past, even up to two years ago, I, I was the guy that I was on the extreme end of the spectrum. So I referenced some of these lethality studies that Cody and I ran. And when you look at like the data points and then you look at the average and the means of all the data, there's always like a couple outliers on the high side and the low side. And I was always <laughs> an outlier data point on the high side, like running 780 grain arrows, like 740 grain arrows, like super, super heavy setups. Um, and again, I'm only sh- like almost every whitetail that I shoot is 15 yards and under. So like having a really fast arrow, like just never really concerned me. I, I really liked a super heavy arrow that hit like a freight train that was sticking six inches in the dirt on the other side of the animal. Like that's what I wanted. Um, and that's what my goals were. And so my suggestion to people up until a year and a half, two years ago was always shoot the heaviest arrow you possibly can the most accurately you can. Uh, so if you find that after 650 grains, your accuracy and your stability and things are starting to drop off, then, then, you know, where that threshold is, you should stick around that 640 range. But if you drop down to 500 grains, or I'm sorry, like 580 grains to 600 grains, and you get more accurate, like significantly more accurate to where you're like, man, I, I might be able to add five yards to my effective range in the whitetail woods by drop dropping down 50 grains 75 grains like then you should do that as long as you can achieve perfect arrow flame that's key so i guess my suggestions to people have changed from shoot the heaviest arrow you possibly can accurately to shoot the most air accurate arrow setup that you possibly can to get perfect arrow flight and you should be targeting that 550 to 650 grain range if you're shooting like you know 43 pounds up to 55 pounds, 58 pounds uh, on the fingers at your draw length. So last year was was significantly different for me. It's actually my my arrow weight and my bow weights like continuing to drop year over year. So this past season, I, I hunted with 42 pounds at my draw length. I have a 29 inch draw length and I was running 580 grain arrow with two, 250 grains up, or 250 uh, grain heads up front. And uh, so it was what like a, spine I think it was a 50 or 75. I, I was running, uh, I was running day six, five hundreds, um, this, this past season. And I mean, every arrow I shot at, I mean, these just uh, super impressive, uh, penetration, super impressive lethality this past season. I just, I really enjoyed it. I, I really enjoyed the accuracy. My confidence was through the roof. So, you know, in past years, giving people advice to like, go heavier, go heavier. Like I didn't realize, I didn't realize how significantly, like how much I was actually sacrificing accuracy in the whitetail woods, um, yeah. by being that heavy, being above that 700 grain threshold. Well, and that's what, like, I tell people when choosing a spine, choose what's going to give you flexibility. And, and what I mean in that is like, if I want to shoot a 350 spine, it's going to have to be full length and I'm going to have to run 250 grains out front uh because i'm a 28 inch draw and i shoot 45 at my draw weight um at least with this setup uh now my last setup was i was shooting 55 pounds and so i had to go to a 340 to have flexibility um so so Mm -hmm. for instance what i mean by that is this current setup if i want to shoot if if i want to shoot a 350 or a 340 spine, I've got to go to a, a 250 grain broadhead and leave that all the way long. Whereas if I go to 500, then I can really play with length and weight of what I like and what shoots good. So I can run a 30 inch arrow with a uh, 175, or I can run 29 with 200, or I can run, you know, full length with 225, whatever. I can play with that. I have room to play. Mm-hmm. Whereas last year I was shooting 55 pounds. I had to run a 340 to have room to play. Whereas if I ran a 500, I had to cut that as short as I could and run like 150. Um, so I tell people mm-hmm. start where, because I have found the most frustration I can cause myself is when I go to tune a new bow and I'm maxed out on the range of an arrow. Like if I start tuning this yeah, bow right. 350, <laughs> I'm just going to yeah. get frustrated because I can't play with length <laughs> and I don't have a lot of room to play with weight. 
Um, so yeah. start with an arrow yeah. that you have. I'm a, I'm a big, I'm a big test kit guy personally. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. So start with an arrow that you have room to play with, experiment with, figure out what the bow likes, what you like, what your shooting method likes. Um, and, and you'll save yourself a whole lot of frustration. Absolutely. Yeah. I completely agree with all that. So what is your, um, just for reference, what is your, your arrow setup? with your crawl right now you said you're a 22 point on um what's your distance in mm. your crawl right now yeah so i'm uh i'm roughly like i don't know a little over half an inch maybe three quarters of an inch down from the knock um i'm running an ht21 riser um it's an ilf riser with uka vx plus limbs on it 42 pounds at my draw length and i'm running a 500 spine day six arrow i think i have their I, ch I changed I changed my arrow setup so much year over year and like even mid year and stuff and I'm always testing different things for people so um, I'm not 100 percent sure what what component system I have up front with his but it's the day six component system I think it's the 75 grain or maybe the 50 grain system and then I have 250 grains up front and I run a cut throat two blade broadhead or the VPA three blades those are my two uh, go to broadheads and then my so that's like said, quite a bit of weight my, the vertical front. post. To be able yeah, to run, yeah, it is, spot. it is, <clears throat> yeah, it is. But I'm, I, I'm only running for forty two pounds, um, oh, yeah, and then forgot, also that, the, yeah, and the nice thing, I'm, I'm running a an Accutune with a springy um, on it, so I'm, it's an elevated rest essentially. So I'm getting like really clean arrow flight. I'm not having to like, I'm not shooting it out of an ASL where it's having to wrap around the riser and you know do some funky things clearing the bow so like my arrow flight is micro tuned like the minute the fletchings are clear clearing the shelf um so i can get away with maybe you know running some heavier tip weight with a lighter spine arrow gotcha uh well and i forgot you said 42 pounds um yeah so yeah, i tell people light. i tell people really <laughs> if you're if you're shooting a hunting weight bow if you're shooting 40 to 55 pounds well 40 to 50 Start with a 500 spine. Um, you might bump up to a 350, um, but start with a 500 spine. Uh, I'm sorry. You might bump up to a 400 or a 350. 400, get, yeah. Mm -hmm. Once you get more up in that range, uh, you know, if you're shooting 52, 53, you might have to bump up. But 500 is a really good place to start. Um, and people are like, 500 spine? I've never shot a 500 spine in my life. So my 12-year-old shoots. And I'm like, yeah, but your 12-year-old shoots 40 pounds out of their compound you're shooting 42 out of a recurve like it's gonna you'll be fine um mm -hmm. so that's where i tell people to start just because again that's going to give you flexibility because if you immediately jump to a 250 you're like well aaron schneider shoots 250 yeah aaron schneider shoots a 60 pound draw weight and he's you know shooting 300 grains out front he can shoot a 250 mm -hmm. it's not going to give you any flexibility so start somewhere where you'll have some flexibility and it'll make you yeah, you might have to move up, but you won't get frustrated as quick. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all, all these distributors all offer test kits as well. So I would really urge people to not decide on their airspine, like let their bow tell them because it, regard if you get a new bow and you're like, oh, it's 42 pounds, my old Black Widow or my my Bob Lee that I always shot, like required a 500. I, I should be good around this 500 and you invest in those arrows. It's just it's just adding frustration because. The grip geometries change the way you approach shooting the bow, the weight distribution, like the mass weight distribution is going to change how those limbs come in time and how the arrow, like the forces on the back of the arrow as the limbs in the arrows coming back to brace and detaching from the string. Like all of that plays into getting perfectly good arrow flight, clearing the shelf. So like in that scenario, I would really urge somebody to buy a test kit of 500, 400 and a 350 mm -hmm. and then let the bow tell them through the tuning process what's better and then go with there because I, I personally i would rather run a stiffer arrow if if all things being equal i would run a, a stiffer arrow than a, a weaker arrow just based off of penetration of Wait, benefits that we're yeah. finding through our tuning studies a stiffer arrow penetrates better um there's less deflection it's like trying to push a wobbly noodle through a hole it's going to bind up a whole lot easier than if you have an, a, a stiffer structure moving through there's just a lot less energy loss as it's impacting a target um so but your point taken don't pin, don't pigeon your pigeonhole yourself into an extreme yeah. case to where 
you have no room to move. And now you're like, well, crap, I just burned up these, these dozen arrows. I, I cut six of the dozen arrows and, you know, you burned them up. Yeah. So test kits are your friends for sure. Well, and that's what like this last bow, I was trying to start at a 350, a 340. Mm-hmm. And like I was getting so frustrated because there was no room to wiggle. Like it had to be full length and I was getting up to like 300 grains and it still was too stiff. And I'm like, God, this is just not working. Like it's just, and then I jumped to a 500 spine and I'm like, oh, this is awesome. I can cut two inches off and run 250 right. out front and it's flying like a dart. Right. Um, it just, yep. it, it alleviates a lot of the frustration behind trying to make it to the extreme and getting a bow to work. Um, now I did want to jump back really quick. So yeah, say yeah. somebody right now, they have a perfectly tuned bow. They hear you talking and they're like, man, I got to try this fixed crawl method. What are mm-hmm. the steps they take to figure out? So if I go out and start shooting and I crawl down half an inch and I'm like, oh, I really like that side picture. Mm-hmm. That's good. Then they start yeah, changing yeah. the tune to fix that crawl, to fit that crawl. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's so, right. Yeah. So just just go out and crawl down the string and see what you like. Your your arrow flight might be slightly erratic. Uh, you might get some porpoising, some up and down movement and knock travel while it's in flight. But aside from that, like you're going to you're going to see a different sight picture and you're going to immediately go like, oh, I like not aiming at the ground. I like being able to put the tip of my arrow right below the chest of the animal. Like I do enjoy that. And if that's like fits with you or a lot of people like they try the fixed crawl and they're like, whoa, too weird. I don't like that arrow being up by my eye. I don't like seeing the tip of the arrow near the deer, right? They're more of an instinctive kind of mental process. Like they like the subconscious to run that. So keeping the arrow tip far away from the animal might be better for them from a mental execution perspective. So just go out there and give it a try. Like you said, crawl down the string an inch and see what happens and and shoot at a large bale or or one of your bigger 3Ds that give you some vertical room to play um, and, and just give it a go. And then once, if you're like one of the people that are like, I really like this, I'm going to start exploring this. Then you can move into the tuning process, which is no different. You'll readjust your knock height slightly. You might have tiller adjustments to make. Um, And then also you can experiment with uh, pressure, healing the bow, and then also finger pressure um, to to get it to work if if you don't have like the benefits of ILF or more modern recurves. So with a new bow, so say you get a new bow and you know you're going to shoot Mm -hmm. a crawl out of it. Do you start? the tuning process with some sort of crawl and then refine always always. okay so you don't i couldn't honestly to be honest with no no i I couldn't even tell you the last time i've shot a bow up against the knock or split finger okay to be honest with you like it's it's been probably three years since i competed in um outdoor nationals which is a 50 meter round and i had to be up against the knock to get that distance with my light target limbs um, but aside gotcha. from that, like I, I hardly ever shoot from up against the knock ever. I'll just, I'll run right to the crawl. I know I can, I can grab a bow. Like if I'm just standing at the range with somebody and they're like, Hey, you want to shoot your bow? I, I can usually get pretty close with like the, the weight and the arrow that length, length that I'm shooting. Like, it's kind of like a gut feel. I'll draw back from like a half inch crawl and I'll like aim at the target. I'm like, ah, oh, that doesn't look right. And I'll let the bow down and maybe crawl down three quarters of an inch. And I might have slightly erratic arrow flight shooting their bow and trying it out. But for the most part, like if I was like, oh, yeah, this is bow. I'm going to buy this bow from this guy or whatever. Like I, I know I could get that thing tuned in pretty quick. So you you get the bow out of the package and you start to tune it. You're going to mm-hmm. you're going to tune it with, say, half an inch crawl. But then once that bow is tuned and you start shooting and you're like, oh, to get my 22, I have to be three quarters of an inch crawl. Mm-hmm. So then you just adjust your crawl a little bit and then fix the tuning issues that came with adjusting it. That's right. Yep. It's just like a small Perfect. iterative process and it usually takes a couple to take, get into it. Um, just small little micro adjustments as you go. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely a slightly iterative process because like you said, depending on maybe you're playing with broadheads and you want to try this like vertical broadhead method I was just talking about my cutthroats and my VPAs don't have the same height um, broadhead, right? Like the blade. So depending on which one's going to be in your number one position in your quiver and you're playing around with broadheads are going to slightly change your crawl that you're going to need. Um, so, but for the most part, like where I'm at right now with my hunting bow, like it's so micro tuned with the setup and these arrows and I can throw any broadhead up front and it's just like, I'm getting laser beam type trajectory with out of these arrows for the last two seasons. I, I won't even move my fixed crawl. And so 
if I want to play with a different broadhead, I just accept the fact that I go from a 22 yard point on to maybe a 26 yard point on, or maybe it's a 20 yard point on, uh, just based off the height of the broadhead blade coming off the top. And cause I, yeah. I it's so micro tuned. I don't want to mess with it. And I, I know that my aiming, like my subconscious gap stinctive type of aiming method within 100, 200 arrows are going to completely reprogram itself. And I, I can shoot just as accurately with a 25 yard fixed crawl versus a 21 yard. Well, and that's where my, uh, that's where I learned that I really like holding a couple inches under. I didn't like point on, I changed mm -hmm. my setup just a touch and, and it changed my point on just a touch. And I'm like, man, I really like holding under right underneath yeah. the belly of the deer. <laughs> I, like do where too. I, can, <laughs> I, I can stare through my spot, but I can see perfectly right where the, you know, yep. I just really like that. Absolutely. So. So do I, and that's one of the benefits. I like running this vertical broadhead blade because it almost takes that away. Like I don't get that weird anxiety that you have when you have that hump of that arrow in your sight picture, when you're having to cover up because now you can see on both sides of that broadhead blade. And so you can run a 22 yard fixed crawl, but also just raise that blade up to 25 or raise the blade up to 30 yards as you're raising that up. And you're kind of like staring through the blade, um, just like yeah. a really uh, thin sight pin. It's pretty nice. Yeah, absolutely. What is your favorite bear recurve you've ever shot? Ooh, man, probably this right here, this, 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 uh, mag riser right here. This oh, bear you've mag, got a mag riser. riser. That, yeah. Is that yeah. I got one? a couple bears up there. Yeah. I got a, I got a Kodiak up there. Yeah. It's an old one. Um, actually gifted from me, gifted to me from Tom Clum. Um, I, I saw this bow one time at, I, it might've been Etar. And, uh, and I started every time I saw him for like the next year and a half or so, I just hounded him like, let me buy that bow from you. Do let me, it's factory camo, factory camo limbs. Like it's all original. The whole thing. I put a Selway quiver on it. It's dude, this thing is awesome. 58 inches. It's so cool. Um, and then finally, like, he's like, I'm not going to sell you that bow, Matthew. I'm not selling you this bow, but I'm going to give it to you <laughs> as a friend. I'm just going to give it to you and I don't want any money for it. So he, uh, he gave me that bow. It was really cool. That is cool. Yeah, yeah, man, I, uh, I, I like the mag riser a lot. Um, I don't know if what I'm are you running to say right now? This. I'm, I'm shooting the, uh, Fred Eichler signature series takedown. Uh, um, oh, okay. You like that? I do. Yeah. I, I really like the grip of it compared to the mag riser. Um, just because I like a thin grip, you know, even on my compounds, I was, mm -hmm. you know, I'd take off the grips and just run metal riser. Sure. And so I like the really thin grip that the Eichler gives you. Um, but I also, I'm, I'm, I, I'm a traditional guy, so I really like wood. Um, you know, I really yeah, like sure. beautiful <laughs> yeah, wood. I'm torn, um, dude. Look at my rack yeah. behind me. I have one piece I, long bows, beautiful wood bows. Good, good I have a combination this, of everything, you know, 25 inch <laughs> Hoyt exceed and everything. It's, it's, uh, I know it's, uh, the struggle's real whenever it comes to it. It's like, oh man, I love dabbling in like the new yeah. tech type of high-end limbs high-end risers but also there's nothing better like my current obsession right now is uh st patrick lakes longbow uh asl bow so i'm like on the complete opposite side of the spectrum compared to what i'm going to be hunting with but i'm obsessed with this longbow i just can't stop shooting it it's so awesome well i don't know if i'm allowed to say this yet so if i'm not i apologize to the guys at bear and i will edit it out but um <laughs> Next month, I'm actually driving down uh, to Gainesville, Florida, where uh, Art Bear Archery's recurves are all produced and their compounds, but um, they're all made and produced right there. And uh, do a podcast with uh, with Neil there, who is Fred Bear's last student, the guy that Fred Bear last mm -hmm. you know took under their wing and taught. Uh, and he's going to make me a custom one of one recurve. Um, and cool, so I'm really dude. That, that sounds awesome. I'm torn on that so one. So are you having to like, pick? Are you having to pick a bow model then? Yes, and like all the colors oh, and glass and woods <laughs> and, and like oh, what yeah. what inlays I want and but I'm most torn. Oh, like man. I'll figure that out. Um, but people are like, "You're gonna hunt with it? You're gonna hang it on the wall?" And I'm like, "I don't know because I really want to hunt with it." Oh, you got to hunt with but that thing, man. I also really want to hang it on the wall forever. Uh, but I think I have decided. <laughs> I think I have decided. What, what is it? Um, what are you going to go with? People, you know, if you buy like one of their one of 50 or you buy number three of 50, mm -hmm. that's a collector's item bow. So like people will buy it, you know, 10 years down the road for ungodly amounts of money. 
because it was custom made, it was one, it was one of 50. This bow is made for me. Like it, you know, I'm never going to sell it. Mm-hmm. So right. I don't care to sure. hold the value of it. it's never been hunted with. It's never been shot. Like I don't care yeah. to hold that value. So I'll hunt with it for 10 years and then hang it up for, to be a piece of, you know, art in my house. That's what I think mm-hmm. I've decided on to hunt with it for a while, put a few mo- notches on it, Heck yeah. kill some stuff with it and then hang it up and let it be a family, you know, pass it down and, and let it be a, a piece of art. Do you know, do you want to know what my answer to your conundrum would be? What? I would get a Fredbear takedown B riser, 100% phenolic. Okay. Just black on black with maybe an accent stripe running down the middle with a set of their long limbs. That right there would be sweet. So that would be a 64 inch bow. If I, I think, yeah, I'm, baby, I think I'm right on that. That's right. Um, yeah. 64 inch bow. What? So going back that, that's another question. What have you found to be too long for hunting and or too short to enjoy shooting? <clears throat> um, so anything, anything for me personally, I have a 29 inch draw length. I don't really like playing with anything under 62 inches. Um, like that bear mag, that, that 58 inch bow. I love that thing to death, but it's just, for me, it's not super enjoyable. And I know I'm, I know there's old materials, old, older technology in in that, in that bow. Right. So they're not the nicest drawing limbs on on that old. I mean, this thing has to be, I, I, I don't know what the year is on it. Um, but I, I've, I've played with, I have like a yeah, Omega no, native back there. That's like a 60, 56 inch bow. That's that shoots nice. But I'm, I'm personally, I'm 62 inches or above. I typically like to hunt with 64 to 66 inches. Here, here's really? my theory on that. Like, yeah. So my arrow count, I try to shoot around hundred to 150 arrows a day, five days a week. Like if I can get there and admittedly right now, this summer, my, my arrow count is down lower than it has been for years. But if I can hit that, that's like 20,000 arrows a year that I can shoot, right? A year. And then in a good year, hunting, whether you're hunting hogs, small game, animal, like turkeys, deer, right? All, all whatever you do as a, as a semi-successful hunter, you'd be lucky to shoot 10, 15 arrows at deer. So when you do that math, it's like 0.001% of the arrows you're shooting out of this bow are at an animal, the other 99.998% of the arrows coming out of that bow is at a target practicing. So I'm going to set up a bow for maximize my accuracy and maximize my enjoyment for the 99.998% of arrows that are coming out of it. And for hunting, okay, I might not be able to use that brand of ground blind, or I might have to watch that upper limb while I'm in a tree stand and just pay attention to it. But I'll tell you this, I've never had any issues with a longer 64 66 inch bow aside from getting my lower limb smacking my leg once and once you do it once you'll never do it again <laughs> but that's kind really? of my that's kind of my theory yep so i've always i've always worried about um which i'm gonna pull this up did you see their uh the most recent special they did um on their uh on their bows who's that bear yeah the 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 um 90th anniversary bows i don't think i saw that so they're like a green glass i'm pulling it up a, right now um which I, i'm going to share it just to show people um that's always been my worry about longer bows is like, what if I get into a ground blind and I can't shoot the bow? Like, Mm -hmm. and you know, sometimes you get into a situation where you're showing up to hunt with somebody and you know, it just, you never know. And so what if I get into a blind and it's like, Oh, I literally can't shoot this bow in this blind, uh, because it's 64 inches long. Um, or, you know, you're, you find yourself, in a hedgerow and and it's really tight quarters and it's just like man this i can't pull the bow back and shoot it Mm -hmm. um so i've always kind of tricked myself into thinking you have to have a shorter bow mm -mm. no that's not i've I've only encountered one blind that has been like you literally can't shoot out of it and it was because of a 
just a it was designed for a compound and for it was just an ill placed two two by four for for a recurve that you know it was built when the person was shooting compound so um but aside from that like even if i'm ground hunting with a ghillie suit i i prefer a longer bow to be able to have my bow resting on the lower limb tip as the animal's approaching so you're not holding it up there and shaking and then the movement to get the full draw is so much is smaller right it's it's a couple inches it's a couple inches less of movement whenever that deer's in the red zone uh and then for tree stand hunting i mean i i don't have any issues with with bow length in a tree stand huh well that's that's good to know because i've almost always yeah. uh i've almost always told myself that um i i had to shoot a shorter bow um and so i'm kind of excited to try one longer now that i just have somebody mm -hmm. tell me no, oh, yeah. You can. So I oh, really yeah, like I this that. color. Um, yeah, that's sweet. I really like the color like of that, that green light glass. wood with the green glass. Mm -hmm. But no, yeah, I, really there's neat. a lot of choices I, to, to mess around with. But That's really cool. Very, yeah, very man. Cool. Well, um, well, good luck on trying to figure your, that out. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. It's a good problem to have, I guess. <laughs> two yeah, two exactly. questions I got for you. Yes, What's sir. your number one tip? Um, when somebody is getting into traditional archery, it can come to choosing a bow or it can be, uh, mm -hmm. the journey and choosing a, an aiming method, whatever. What's your number one tip that you give people, uh, when getting into traditional archery? Okay. Number one tip, uh, especially with the audience that's listening here for the uninitiated that has a desire to get into traditional archery, they've probably shot compounds all their life. They probably have really good biomechanics, really good muscle memory. They've put hours and hours and hours into shooting and perfecting that craft of shooting their compound bow. The biomechanics of shooting a traditional bow are way more similar than you could possibly think to shooting a compound. So leverage all of that biomechanic muscle memory. Do not grab a bow. If you shoot your compound standing up vertically, nice and tall, nice and confident, with your head erect above your shoulder blades coming into a nice repeatable anchor and running your shot like a boss the first thing you do when you grab a recurve do not spread your feet farther than shoulder width apart and hunch over and have the bow at further than 45 degree angle and try to shoot in this like hidden tiger crouching tiger hidden dragon thing right stand up tall <laughs> shoot the bow exactly how you shoot your compound and i promise you accuracy is going to come so much faster if you can leverage the decades of practice you've put into shooting a bow and arrow so that's the I'm number one because piece of advice so I much do. more than you would ever <laughs> well, i don't know dude it's it's a light switch i i have guys that are bow club every i tell the story all the time when i'm on a podcast i got guys on the bow club stand there shooting their compound like a boss standing up like a man bang just running their shot they're like hey that recurve looks cool can i try it yeah hand it to them immediately they turn into an indian immediately they're like looks like they're taking a crap bending over whipping arrows down and it's like dude you're not even getting back to your face <laughs> like you're not even getting to an anchor like how how it's such a light switch it's like literally within 30 seconds of hanging their compound up to grabbing the recurve like the approach is completely different so i i really urge guys you know if you're if you're thinking about picking up a recurve or you currently do stop shooting the recurve like you think a recurve should be shot and shoot it like your compound and you're going to shoot it much much better i promise the best advice i ever got was from Tom Clum and he said a bow is a bow like you shoot the bows mm -hmm. the same way you're gripping the, That's you're right. holding the string just a little bit different you don't have a release so you, this is your release and, and and you might you might have a different grip on the on the bow but a bow is a bow like people ask like, what my draw if I run a 28 inch draw on a compound what my draw length be I'm like 28 inches like you don't you're not <laughs> mind blow now I do I, I say that, Joe, I, I'm a 27 and a half on a compound. The way that I anchor my recurve, I'm a 27. Yeah, sure. With releases and how they it. attach the string. Yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. But yeah, I mean, a bow is a bow, dude. Quit trying to think you have to mm. recreate everything you've That's ever right. known about archery. Um, but one time, man, we were down in South Texas and we were on a hunt. And uh, this was actually the hunt that I killed my first animal with a recurve on. And so my buddy, same thing. He's like, dude, can I try that? And I'm like, sure. And we actually... I actually had some of the guys from Bear Archery down there with us. And uh, and this guy has been an archery hunter his whole life. You, you would have thought he's got, he knows what an anchor point is. I mean, he knows all these things. And he was getting the bow back to like right here and then shooting it. And mm -hmm. I'm like, 
dude, mm-hmm. you got to come to an anchor point. And he's like, <laughs> and he literally looks at me and then he starts arguing. He's like, I am you idiot. And I'm like, <laughs> you're like this far away. Like That's you're right. three quarter drawing it. And he's like, no, dude, I'm full of drawing. I'm at an anchor point every time. I'm like, <laughs> And so I got to take a video of him and I'm like, look how stupid right. you look. And he's like, oh, I'm like, dude, it's just the same as your bow. Like it's <laughs> that's funny. functions just like your bow. It's just, you don't get a let off. I mean, that's, right. that's a great tip. Where all can they find mm-hmm. the push? Where can they, where do they go to find you online on, on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, where do they find you at? Yep. So uh, the push archery.com is a portal to everything. We film all of our hunts and we put, put them up there every single year. So that, you can jump over to our YouTube channel there. It's called the push archery Instagram. Facebook is the push archery. And then on the website, uh, we have cool products like quivers and different, different cool archery accessories for traditional bow hunters and compound bow hunters. Um, and then also we have our online school, which has best in class instruction from the greatest coaches, minds and champions of traditional archery. And, uh, you can get there, access that it's called the push archery center of knowledge. And there's big buttons all over our website to jump into the, the online school and be, be taught by some of these great, great coaches, no matter where you live in the country. Now, guys, listen, I also, I have said this from the podcast many, many times. While online resources are phenomenal, like the amount of knowledge that we have getting into archery now is, is just crazy compared to what they had even 10 years ago. Um, I've always said that, but I've also always said you have to be careful about just listening to any and everything that you hear. Um, I can almost promise you this. Anything that the push puts out is good information that you can trust and you can believe in. So this is a resource where if you are getting into traditional archery, absolutely 100% dive in. Um, there's not, there's, there's few guys in the industry that I will tell you, listen to anything they say. These are some of those guys that I can 100% say that because a, I know, I mean, they're backed by Tom. They're backed by, 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 um, Joel Turner, they're backed by some of the greatest recurve shooting minds in the world. So, hundred mm. percent. If you hear them say it, uh, you can trust it. Um, I appreciate that. Another though. resource means a lot. With the with the <laughs> the tone of this episode, I do want to plug. Uh, maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago, we did a traditional one hundred and one series, starting from the ground up: how to choose a bow, how to tune the bow, how to aim the bow, how to shoot the bow. We did a full series. Uh, we had Fred Eichler and Aaron Schneider and Tom Clum and Chris Perino. We had um, Clay Hayes. We had all these guys on to talk about traditional archery. So jump back if, if you're like, man, I really want to dive into that. That's a, a multiple mm-hmm. episode uh, series that you can listen to and learn from the ground up how to shoot a bow. But guys, I promise you, um, these guys right here are the real deal. So if you are getting into it, the information they put out is stuff that you can trust. Guys, I know, I know, uh, cheap, interchangeable blade knives, they're all in the rage. Change your blade right there, and you can keep going. And it, It's cool, and I have one in my bag, and I like to keep one in my bag. However, there is no replacement for a well-built, hand-forged knife, something that I know is dependable, it's strong. If I pick it up, it's going to be sharp, it's going to be ready to go. Um these right here are knives built by my good friend, Nick Deeker, Nick's Knife Works. And um, the most beautiful part of this is it's not cut and dry. You don't just pick out a knife and say, well, I guess that's the one I need. No, 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 no. He built this one specifically to the length that I wanted it. I wanted this to fit right on the side of my binocular harness so it was always there, always ready for me to grab. He built this one to fit really small in my pocket uh, for an everyday carry. Guys, a good hand-forged knife is worth its weight in gold. Go check out Nick Deeker at nicksknifeworks.com. Guys, thank you so much for listening. You guys have a fantastic week. <laughs>